tomorrow. I think I have a new song, Because He Lives, right? I think based tomorrow, and it really starts on today. Our message today comes from Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, verses 13 and 15, and then the 53rd chapter, verse 1. And it reads, See my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as, they, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So we're going to talk about today. It's all about Jesus. You know, but today is all about Jesus. You know, in the spring of 1981, the president of a national hotel chain was speaking at a conference in Atlanta. And while he was there, he decided that he needed a haircut. So he went to one of the local barbers. And as he sat in the barber's chair, he started up a conversation, and he asked his barber, he says, what are you doing for vacation this summer? And the barber said, well, my wife and I are going on a road trip, and we're going to drive to Phoenix. And really, the um, hotel president said, he says, where are you going to stay on this road trip? Well, the barber said, well, on the way out there, we're going to stay at the cheapest hotels possible so that when we get there, we can afford to stay in something really nice. And the hotel president thought to himself as he was sitting there, he said, this guy is never going to stay in my hotel because on the way out there, it's too expensive. And when he gets to Phoenix, it will be too inexpensive. So then he went back to his office, sat down with his board of directors, and announced, he says, one size doesn't fit all. And he says, we need to diversify because we want to meet the needs of different people. And as a result, a company that offered four levels, four levels of hotel was uh, created. It's the Sleep Inn, the Comfort Inn, the Quality Inn, and the Clarion. And the company is Choice Hotels, right? right? So on that first Easter Sunday, the followers of Jesus had a variety of needs as well. Some needed to see Jesus again for themselves. Some needed to touch the nail print in his hands and his feet. And others just needed to be reminded of what Jesus had said. And the same is true for us today. What we need from Jesus when we look to him today is different from each of us. We all weren't drawn to church on the Sunday morning for the same reason. Some people came because they're curious on Sunday morning. Others came to keep peace in the family. Your spouse, your partner, your parent asked you to come. So you came because they asked you to come. Some came because they worship on every Easter Sunday. And they can't imagine being any place else on this day. It's a habit or it's a tradition. In any event, one size doesn't fit all. But the story of Easter grips each of us no matter why we came. Because what we receive on Easter Sunday morning is common to each of us. We all receive a Savior whose death on the cross created the path to salvation for all of us. We receive an advocate who now sits on the right hand of the Father and petitions God for us while we're in this life. And we receive a resurrected Savior who defeated death and promised to come back and receive us unto himself so that where he is, we can be also. So here's the thing. No matter who you are or what you need, Jesus is Lord of all. And today, it's just all about Jesus. The first point today is that all of us can be saved. You know, our scripture today, verses 13 and 14, references the humiliation, the disfigurement, and the suffering of Christ on the cross on Good Friday. 
And even as we left, left this place on Friday, we knew that we could anticipate more to that. Because the scripture said, in due time, he'll be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. He'll be lifted higher than the heavens. And he would succeed in the work that he came to do. So verse 15 says, so he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. But what they were not told, they will see. What they have not heard, they will understand. Many nations will be sprinkled with his blood and they'll be better because of him. You know, Peter says to us in Acts, the 10th chapter, the 36th verse, it says, You know the message of God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through um, Jesus Christ, who's Lord of all. So Jesus opened the door to salvation to all nations. And Jesus is Lord of all means that all people can be saved by the sprinkling or the shedding of his blood. In Acts 10, there is a centurion named Cornelius. And he was a Roman soldier who was in charge of an Italian regiment of soldiers. And they were distinguished in their courage and in their bravery. And the scripture says that Cornelius and his entire family were devout and God-fearing and that he gave generous to, generously to those who were in need, and he prayed to God regularly. But they were Gentiles, not Jews. And Jews of that time looked down on Gentiles as heathens, and they viewed them as unclean and beyond the reach of salvation. And so when a Gentile wanted to become a Jew by faith, he was circumcised, and he became what was called a God-fearer. A god fearers were allowed into the community of believers, but they were regarded as second-class citizens. It became a real point of contention between Peter and Paul because Paul was continuously calling out uh, Peter on his views. Then the Lord sent Peter a vision, and in that vision, God told Peter that the Gentiles could become Christians as well. And so we see Peter in Acts, the 10th chapter, the 28th verse says, God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. And verse 34 says, God shows no partiality. And so the Lord sent Peter to Cornelius and his family, and they openly confessed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and were baptized. And Peter preached that day and said, I now realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what's right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus, the Lord of all. That is the result of the sprinkling of, uh, of Christ's blood across many nations, that we all now understand that the gospel of salvation is for all people everywhere. No one is excluded from God's grace given in Jesus Christ and in the cross. Jesus died that all might be saved. And we see in Revelations, the fifth chapter, the ninth verse, it says, Because you were slain, and with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. So the fact that Jesus is Lord of all not only means that he's Lord of the Jews, <coughs> and Lord over the Gentiles, and all people everywhere. But that means that he's my Lord, and he's your Lord. That Jesus is the Lord of all means that Christians, as Christians, we all come under his ultimate authority. And that's just not powerful theology. That's a personal confession, the way of salvation. And we get to make that personal confession because of Good Friday's crucifixion, and Jesus' Sunday morning resurrection. He isn't just our Savior, he's our Lord. So each Easter brings us this new reality about Jesus. And in Acts 10, what we see, we see Peter began to see the new realities of God's grace and justice because Peter is now in a space where he can't ignore Jesus' perspective. You know, earlier in the New Testament, we see Peter going back and forth with Jesus as Jesus talks about the fact that he's going to die on the cross. And so now Peter understands a little bit better. He's glimpsed the extent of the love and peace that God is bringing into the world through Jesus. 
and he began to understand what he heard previously and what he saw. He's beginning to understand that the spread of Jesus' message doesn't stop at the boundaries of Judea and Jerusalem. So Cornelius and his family, they aren't the only ones who's experiencing a conversion. Peter is also experiencing a conversion in Acts 10. And so Easter brings a new reality for us as well. It's all about Jesus. We're called to tell the story of Jesus in a way that frames our own story of salvation and the story of salvation for the whole world. And Peter begins by suggesting that Jesus' whole ministry can be summed up this way when he says it announces the good news of peace through Jesus Christ and his Lord of all. The Easter story is a current and ongoing story. The second point is that Jesus is Lord of life. So we said that Jesus is Lord of all, but that also means that he's Lord of the living and the dead. We tend to think about salvation and eternity is some, as something for the future, but it brings gifts to this life as well. You know, the new life that Cornelius and his, and his family found in Christ was extraordinary. It was for Cornelius. It is for us as well. Christ is the plus in our lives. The cross of Christ is God's plus for us. He gives us everlasting life, but he gives us even more in this life. Scripture says, for what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. So the gospel brings light to new and unheard of things. It gets our attention. It engages us. And we begin to see the glory of God shining in the face of Christ. We've heard about the Lord of life, but it's different when we experience him. Experience him. You know, in John the second chapter, the seventh through the ninth verse, Jesus turns water to wine. That's his first miracle. And water is ordinary, right? You see it everywhere, every day. But wine is extraordinary. Jesus changed it from water to wine. And throughout his ministry, he took things and people who were ordinary and made them into extraordinary people, unusual and remarkable people. The substitutionary work that he did on the cross was extraordinary. And it immediately began to bring abundant life to people. You know, when people tell you that they had a near-death experience, they will without fail tell you that it changed their life. Well, as sinners saved by grace, we had a near-death experience. Friday night was our near-death experience. But Sunday morning, Jesus called us out of the darkness into the marvelous light. You know, it says that there was this young man who lay near death in intensive care of a hospital, and he was severely injured. And he later told that as he lay there, he said he kept drifting in and out and that he was weakening. But he said, but just as he was about to let go, he heard his mother at his bedside calling his name. Joel? She says, I love you. And he said when he heard her voice, he could feel the strength flowing back into him. But gradually that strength, that strength would ebb away again until he was almost gone. And then he said again, he'd hear the voices of his mother and his father and his family members saying, we love you, we're praying for you, you can make it. And he said that pattern repeated itself over and over again until his condition stabilized. And as he recovered, he shared the experience. Well, Jesus called our name in love over and over again as he hung on the cross and took on our sin and he saved us from our near-death experience, from eternal death. And so God's life-saving work on the cross should not only say, change our lives for eternity, but it should change our present lives as well. Look at Apostle Paul, who persecuted Christians. He had an encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, and Jesus called him by name in Acts, the ninth chapter, the fourth verse, and he radically transformed Paul's life he changed the trajectory of Paul's life. 
Sister Paul was willing to sacrifice all to share the word of God. There was a time in Paul's life is that that crowd that he was hanging with originally when he was persecuting Christians were afraid of him and turned his back on him. And the, and the, new, uh, the other Christians whom he had been persecuted didn't trust him. So that left Paul out there on his own. But he understood better than anyone else that a leper could change his spots. And as a result, the world has never been the same because Paul, life so dramatically changed by the Holy Spirit, he was able to hear the good news of the gospel and share the good news of the gospel. You know, Peter, who was a devout Jew, was willing to risk his credibility with his people and his faith to declare that although Jews enjoyed a special relationship with Jesus, that the Gentiles were on equal footing with Jews in the eyes of God. That didn't make him very popular. But Jesus called him by name in Acts the 10th chapter, the 13th verse, and told him to get up and go to the house of Simon the Tanner. And Zacchaeus, the tax collector, changed from cheating people to making amends for all the wrongs he had done. And that's after the Lord told him in Luke, the 19th chapter, the fifth, the fifth verse, Zacchaeus, come down here immediately. So each of us, in count, um, each one of these in individuals demonstrate that there's a moment in each of our lives where Jesus calls us by name. And we understand and accept that he is Lord of our lives. And so we each have a story about that, right? Each of us can say, this is the moment when I found Christ. We each have a sacred moment like that. You know, Henry Nolan says in his book, uh, The Life of the Beloved, he says, when we find Christ, we understand that we're intimately loved long before our parents and our teachers and our spouses and our children and friends loved us. We're beloved by the Lord before this life, during this life, and into the next. Psalms 139, the verses 13 and 14 says, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am full, fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And verse 16 says, you saw my unformed body. All the days ordained, ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And the Lord says in Isaiah 49 and 6, I have carved you in the palm of my hands. You know, Uncle Sam can take just a piece of paper, stamp a portrait of Ben Franklin on it, and make it worth $100. A simple piece of paper. None of us can do that. In fact, I wouldn't recommend that you do that. It's a federal offense. <laughs> Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos can sign his name to a piece of paper and make it worth billions of dollars because they're wealthy. They can do that. Garth Brooks or whoever your favorite singer is can sing a song and fill a coliseum with screaming fans because he has talent. But God Almighty can take an ordinary life, shape it, mold it, empower it through the Holy Spirit, and make, a, make it a blessing to other people. He can make it extraordinary. So Jesus' work on the cross changed everything. He says, old things have passed away and everything has become new. So to be in Christ literally means to let the Lord of all infiltrate your heart and your life and the very essence of your being will be transformed into Christ's likeness. That's what happened to Paul. That's what happened to Peter. And so God wants to be Lord of this life and transform our lives from fear to faith, from self-centeredness to God-centeredness, from being served to serving. And so we look at the two implications of Peter's word, words that Jesus is Lord of all. It means that he's Lord of the whole world, of absolutely everything in it, all the nation in the world, 
Jews, Gentile. He's the Lord of all people. He's the Lord of absolutely everything. And the final point for this morning is Jesus is Lord of all because of him this morning. Death is not final. We, we walk away with that. You know, Jesus kept talking about being raised from the dead. And our scripture asks this morning, who believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He talked about it and the prophets talked about his resurrection, but no one really believed it. Go back and look at the disciples on the road to Emmaus, the disciples that he hung with all that time. <coughs> they were amazed that God raised him on the third day. That we have a new life after death. That's what the celebration is Easter, about, of Easter is all about. It's all about Jesus. For Christ, death was just a stopover on his way to heaven. So for us, there is a very real physical death that comes to us. But it's not permanent. It's not final. It's not fatal. We're promised life after death. Jesus says, if it were not so, I would not have told you. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people the most to be pitied. If our, only, if our hope is only while we're down here, he feels pity for us. But he says in verse 54, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter proclaimed life, new life, for all of us in Christ. He proclaimed life over death in Acts 10, 38-41. It says, God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And we're witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So since Jesus is Lord of all and death comes to us all. We're called to witness to the Lordship of Christ beyond all barriers, language, culture, geography, economic class, or education. All people of other, every color and kind can receive the gospel of peace through Jesus Christ. That's the good news of Easter. And since Jesus is Lord of all and death comes to us all, we're called to witness that life can be extraordinary for those of us who believe. In Christ, the extra added to life can be called the spiritual joy that he brings into our lives. It's added to our ordinary lives. Only in Christ can people find the joy that they were intended to know when they were born. Through Peter's sermon, that joy came to Cornelius' household. It came to Peter and Paul and Zacchaeus, and it also comes to you and me. And since Jesus is the Lord of all and death comes to us all, we're called to witness to the glorious Easter message that Christ came back from the grave and that we too may have life over death through him. We may die physically, but since the grave could not hold our Lord, the grave can hold us either. The roads we travel pull right up to a grave, which is carved out of the ground on the top of the hill. And when we get to the top of the hill in life, here's the good news. The road doesn't stop there for us. Because of Jesus' resurrection this morning, the road does go far. That's not the end of the journey. There's more beyond. It's just a time of transition, a journey from this world into the next. And because Christ precedes us into our grave, he says to us, come on. Follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the good news of Easter. It's all, it's all about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
I can't think of a better day to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior if you have not been saved. And he makes it as easy as possible for us. He tells us all we have to do is ask him to forgive us of our sins, to come into our lives and to be Lord of our lives. It's just that simple. He says that we just need to confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. Is there one today? Is there anyone today who hasn't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior? 